All right, so in this video, we're going to look at the uh, animal behavior. Um, this is the follow-up to the plant behavior one, and obviously animals have a, a wide range of extensive behaviors, and so um, animal behaviors are, there, there's going to be a lot more to the animal behavior lesson. Um, all right, so one of the first kind of classical studies of animal behavior is that of ethology, and an ethologist um, <clears throat> looks at animal behavior from two perspectives, and the perspectives are kind of outlined in these questions here. What stimulus elicits a behavior and what are the mechanisms that control the, the response? How does the animal's experience during growth and development <clears throat> influence this response? Both of these things are questions that deal with the proxima, proximal cause. In other words, what's happening right now that is causing this particular behavior? The other two questions about, are about uh, how the behavior aids in the survival and reproduction and the evolutionary history, those two things are what we call the ultimate cause. Okay, so this is how the behavior actually evolved in the organism. So the proximal behavior is what's going on right now. The ultimate cause of the behavior is what's the evolutionary background that caused this to evolve in the first place. So what you can see is ethology assumes that there's a genetic component to behavior because there has to be a genetic component to behavior in order for it to be evolved through natural selection. Um, so that's kind of the tenets of behavior, uh, of ethology. And ethologists focus on what's called a fixed action pattern, which is a se sequence of behaviors that um, an organism performs exactly in that sequence, and it has to be done to completion once it's started. The trigger is a sign stimulus. And an example of this um, you can see in moths um, that fly around, and if you ever see moths flying around at night, you know, around a, a light of some sort, uh, some sort, shake your keys. Um, your keys produce some ultrasonic frequencies. And what you'll notice is you can see the moths actually performing their fixed action pattern where they flit for a sec, raise an arm, and that arm raise causes them to spiral downward um, in a dive. Um, and that particular pattern, that fixed action pattern that you see, is there for the purpose of protecting them from predation, right? Because usually ultrasonic frequencies come from bats, which are their main predator, and the bats are, are calling out to try to echolocate where the moth is. Well, if the moth dives and gets out of the way before the bat can get there, then it evades predation, right? Um, another example would be the stickleback fish that you see there. <clears throat> Stickleback fish males have red underbellies, um, and so anything that has a red underside will be attacked by a male. And that's the other thing that's important. These are simple reactions to limited stimuli, okay? So it, I know it seems stupid, like I could paint a brick half white, half red, and stick it into a fish tank containing a male stickleback fish, and the stickleback fish will attack it as if it's another male stickleback fish, and you're thinking probably, well, why? Obviously, it's not a fish, it's a brick, but the idea here is that evolution creates these simple reactions that are adaptive, and in an environment where a stickleback fish actually lives, very few things are going to have that kind of counter shading where they're red on the bottom and light colored on top. So chances are, if a stickleback fish male attacks something that's got a red bottom, it's going to be another male that's coming into its territory trying to take over, right? So it makes sense that that kind of stimulus would elicit that response in, in that situation. Right, so ethology sort of evolved into behavioral ecology. Um, and a behavioral ecologist studies how behaviors controlled, develops, evolves, and contributes to survival within the environment. Okay, so we're now taking into effect environmental factors more heavily. Um, and a lot of the work here is based on a cost benefit analysis. Okay, what are the costs of the behavior versus the benefits of the behavior? And um, they use a, a phrase here, you can see it listed there, Tonstoffel. Um, 
This is a physicist's phrase. It stands for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Okay. In other words, everything that you get costs you something, right? So essentially, animals are always attempting to maximize what they get compared to what they have to put out to get it, essentially. So for foraging behavior um, and, and any kind of food ob obtaining behavior that you would see, it's really about energy here, right? Um, it's about maximizing the energy of you obtain from the food while minimizing the amount of energy you have to put out to get that food, right? So with foraging behavior, most foragers are generalists, right? But food is not chosen randomly. So in other words, they can eat a lot of different things, right? Um, they can eat fruit sometimes, they can eat nuts, they could eat vegetation, right? But when fruits are abundant, fruits have a maximum amount of sugar in them, right? Get a maximum amount of energy with very little energy output to get them on your part, which means when fruits are abundant, the animals are going to forage for fruits more often, right? But when a particular food like fruit goes out of season and becomes scarce, then the animals might search to a different search image. So, okay, well, now we're looking for vegetation. It doesn't offer as much energy as the fruit does, but these aren't toddlers that refuse to eat when it's not their favorite thing, right? They get it. They understand that if they're going to get energy, they're going to have to eat something. So they'll switch and, and look for the next best thing in that instance. So there are always trade-offs to ensure optimal foraging. So for example, the distance of food versus the size of food, right? If you're a monkey living in a tree and you eat fruit in the rainforest and you've got an abundance of fruit around you, it might be small, right? But it's at a relative, it's at your level in the canopy of the rainforest. And so you're fine. And yeah, you might spot a huge fruit in the way upper levels of the canopy. But as long as fruit is abundant near you, even though it's small, you don't have to obtain very much energy to get it. So you're happy and content to stay where you are. You're not gonna go for that huge piece of fruit up in the canopy um, unless fruit isn't abundant because it's gonna cost you a lot of energy to climb up there to get it, right? So um, that's what we mean when we're talking about trade-offs. Um, yeah, the fruit around you is small, but there's enough of it that it's, it's totally fine. You don't have to go off chasing a, a huge piece of fruit and expending a bunch of energy. And you're not going to expend that energy unless you get more energy from the fruit than you would get um, from climbing up there to get it. All right, so these are some other examples of cost-benefit analysis. Um, parental investment, this is kind of like opportunity cost. So in in um, in economics, there's this idea of opportunity cost. What does the cost of a business opportunity, um, like you, what are you willing to put into a business opportunity, but that may also cost you the opportunity to, to invest in something else somewhere else, right, essentially. So the same thing here with parental investment. This is about the amount of energy that you invest in the survival of your existing offspring at the expense of courting and mating and having additional offspring. So a great example of this is lactation, where um, animals will produce milk to feed their offspring, right? What well, that's going to ensure that that offspring that already exists is going to survive. But when a female is, is lactating, when she's producing milk, she's less likely to be able to get pregnant and have another baby um, in most of the mammal world. And so, um, that's the expense. She's not able, she's not as readily able to have another baby while she's taking care of an infant. Um, there's also mate choice. Um, there's always competition between males, right? But female choice um, means that females in nature will put up with different mating schemes. So for example, um, you can monopolize a male that has, say, a territory that's maybe it's quantitative. It, 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 it's got a, a quality rating of 50, whatever that means, right? So the the territory that this male has is is about a 50 in terms of quality. Um, but then you see over across the way, you see another territory that's got a quality of about 200, and a male has one partner and is willing to take on another. Do you stay and be monogamous with the male who has a quality rating of 50, 
or do you go share a male who has a quality rating of about 200? You see the difference? So females will put up with things like polygamy um, in nature if they're getting enough out of it, right? So monogamous schemes evolve when it's more beneficial to be a monogamous, but polygamous schemes in animals will evolve when it's more be beneficial to be polygamous. And then also there's that idea of promiscuity and cheating, right? You come back from migrating, but you come back late. When you get there, all the good males have been taken, the ones with the really good genes. Um, you may have to settle for a poor quality mate or a less than ideal quality of mate when you come back. However, there is the chance that you could go off and find a side mating opportunity um, and come back to your mate and as long as your mate doesn't catch you you're good to go right you've got the high quality genes from the high quality male that you cheated with if you're a female bird but then when you come back to your low, relatively low quality mate um, that low quality mate um, will help you to take care of the offspring and assume that the offspring are his you just have to be careful because if you get caught and you're a female bird that male bird will leave and then you're left raising the chicks on your own. And that is problematic because it's really, really energetically expensive to do that. And most of the time, if a male leaves um, in certain species, the chicks won't survive. All right. So anyway, there's lots of applications here. I'm going to move on from game theory. We may talk about that in class. All right. So the real question in biology is, is behavior nature versus nurture? I know you've heard this before. In reality, there's often a genetic component to behavior, but then there's also learned influences to our behavior, okay, especially for human beings, all right? So there may be a genetic basis to, say, jealousy, right, guarding your mate, things like that. But we all know from a human perspective, you can't be really, really jealous in a relationship or you're going to chase away your mate, right? <laughs> that's, that's just not going to work. Nobody wants to be smothered. So you learn to change that jealous behavior um, based on maybe losing a mate or two, right? So there's really not, it's not necessarily always an either or scenario. Um, there are innate behaviors, but these are be behaviors that are developmentally fixed, meaning they don't change in the environment. So you know you're dealing with an innate behavior if nothing that you do in the environment will fix, will, will change it. Um, learned behaviors are developed in response to lots of environmental stimuli over the course of time. So in other words, these are acquired behaviors and they are influenced by the environment. We have a lot of data on this. We have cross fostering studies where you can understand the extent to which behavior is modified. So you can take chicks from different nests and swap them. That's what we mean by cross fostering um, to see if the genes are more influential in the chick's behavior or the environment, right? Um, scientists can also look at organisms reared in isolation and see that certain behaviors get exhibited perfectly, indicating that they must be genetic. They're programmed behaviors. Um, imprinting is interesting because imprinting is a type of behavior that it is, is like this. You've got both learned and innate components to imprint. Okay, and, and this is what imprinting really is. This limited phase in an animal's development in which uh, the, it's the only time that the animal realizes I am one of these organisms, right? You are human because when you looked up from your crib or your bassinet, people were looking back at you. Um, and you immediately understood, okay, I'm one of them. I have to, I have to mimic their behaviors, right? Um, but what Conrad Lorenz, the scientist who discovered this, um, found out was that imprinting happens in a very, very limited short window in an animal's development. So you can see him here with his goslings. Um, he basically hatched these goslings and realized very, very readily that after he started to raise them that they thought he was mom. And so they followed him just like they would their mom. Um, and they tried to mimic his behaviors as much as possible. So he had to teach them to swim and, and things like that. Um, and he, he was the one that discovered also that imprinting is pretty much irreversible. Once an animal is imprinted, it will stay imprinted. 
Um, you also have directed movements in response to stimuli. And again, notice behaviors generally are in response to some stimulus, right? Other than like, you might see movements that's different from behavior. So if you see, say, a hawk sitting on a tree, you might see it shift its weight, right? Something like that. But that's a comfort movement. That's not necessarily in response to a stimulus, okay? So um, you have... Uh, kinesis, which is a change in activity, um, but usually this is random and undirected. So pill bugs uh, live in moist conditions and they tend to move around in dry areas um, a lot because they're always searching for, for moist or humid areas, right? Okay, so that's kinesis. Um, and it's it's driven by this change to find the or this this uh, need to find the ideal circumstances. You have directed movements that are innate. Um, taxis is an oriented movement toward or away from a stimulus. Okay. Um, migration is a great example of this. Um, birds get a signal that it's time to move, and they they move in a pattern together to a place where it's more hospitable seasonally, and then they move back when, when it's time to come back. Okay, so all of those are, are examples of different kind of movements. Oh, reflexes are interesting. Reflexes are an example of kinesis, but reflexes are not, um, not controlled by the nervous system. Well, they're controlled by the nervous system, but they're not controlled by the brain. Um, so a reflex goes into your spinal cord and your spinal cord deals with, with it pretty much immediately. Um, anyway, all right. Um, along with behavior comes communication, okay? Um, you have signals and communication. A signal is a behavior that causes a change in another animal's behavior. And then communication is going to involve the transmission and reception and response to these signals. Okay. So you can have lots of different types of communication. You can have chemical communication. And I'm, uh, these, I'm not sure that these links are active any longer. Um, but one example is pheromones. A lot of animals put down pheromones, which are um, chemicals that you can perceive um, through your nose, or actually you may not necessarily always perceive them. But, you know, there's a reason why your dog in the morning visits every tree in every corner of your yard, right? That's territory marking. They're laying out a, a scent, a pheromone signal um, that's indicating to any other animals that may come by that this is this is your dog's territory, right? Insects use pheromones for communication. You have auditory communication, so you have a variety of calls. Um, Drosophila males can produce a characteristic song by beating their wings. Um, and then you have visual communication. This can involve anything from um, perhaps uh, a cobra hooding up, right, standing upright, or not standing, but, you know, pulling itself upright and flattening its rib cage to produce that characteristic hood, that visual communicate, that's visual communication. It's attempting to communicate that that cobra wishes to be left alone, right? Um, honeybees will have dances, right? Uh, when a honeybee comes back to the hive after finding a food source, they dance in a particular direction. They may move forward. They may wiggle in one direction or wiggle in another. And that's actually communicating direction to the other bees in the hive to show them which way to go to also exploit the food source. So um, there are environmental factors that can influence um, learning, obviously, right? Um, and they can also uh, influence the development of behaviors in every group of animals. Um, and <laughs> You also can have environmental factors that can change the epigenome as well, so that can also have an influence too, okay? Um, but quality of diet can change the nature of social interactions. In fact, there's a really interesting um, hypothesis about why bonobos, which are also known as pygmy, pygmy chimps, are a much less violent species than their closest relations, which are the, the chimpanzees that we all think of. Um, and it has to do with the fact that bonobos uh, tend to live in areas where there's a high quality diet and there's less competition for food. So they're a lot less aggressive, whereas chimpanzees, for example, are a lot more aggressive by nature because they live in areas where food is a lot scarcer and they have to move a lot to go find food. So anyway, gives you an idea of how that can influence behavior. All right, and then learning is a modification of behavior based on experience, 
Okay, so learning may be direct instruction, like an animal watching another one to do a particular thing. Um, but it can also be you learn because you did the wrong thing and now you know better, right? Your doggy learned to avoid uh, bees and wasps and other stripy, stingy things, possibly by accidentally one time biting one, right? And then that uh, very quickly taught the doggy not to do that ever again, right? Poor doggy probably had a swollen face from the, the bee venom at that moment. Um, so the doggy learned in that instance. Um, because of a specific experience that they had, right? Um, you can have several types of learning. There's a habituation um, where you lose responsiveness to a stimuli because the stimulus isn't really important. Your brain deems it to be an unimportant stimulus. So for example, if you live next to railroad tracks, right? You maybe if you the first few nights after you moved into your house, if the train went past your house, you might have been awakened in the middle of the night by the train. But, you know, the first few nights you wake up because the train goes by, you realize, oh, it's just the train and you, you go back to sleep. That tells your body that that's not an important stimulus. So after a while, the train goes by and your brain perceives the sound of the train, but it doesn't rouse you out of sleep. It lets you keep sleeping. So you've desensitized to that stimulus. It's unfortunately, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's why you're not supposed to set, to snooze your alarm, right? When you hit snooze on your alarm clock, what you're doing is telling your brain, unimportant, let's go back to sleep. And so you train your brain that that sound of the alarm clock is unimportant. And after a while, you stop responding to your alarm clock. So I hate to be the one that tells you that, but that's kind of important for you to know. Um, there's also spa spatial learning, um, <clears throat> which is changing behavior based on um, the spatial structures of the environment. So um, like locating nest sites, hazards, foods, prospective mates based on landmark uh, landmarks in the environment. And then of course you have um, special kinds of learning, associative learning. Um, where you are um, associating one feature of the environment with another. So the classical conditioning would be arbitrary stimulus is associated with a reward or punishment, right? Um, Pavlov had his dogs and he presented them with food while he rang a bell, causing them to have a, a normal reaction to food, right? Which is salivation. So food bell, food bell, food bell. After a while, Pavlov didn't have to have the be the food. All he had to do was ring the bell because the doggies had associated the food with the sound of that bell. So if you have a cat that eats wet cat food and they come running when they hear the electric can opener, you have conditioned your cat to do that, right? Normally kitties don't like mechanical sounds like that, but um, you've, you've trained that cat to associate the appearance of food with that sound. Um, operant conditioning is trial and error learning. Um, so um, essentially you've got a mouse maybe eating a distasteful caterpillar. Um, that's the error, right? They tried it, they made a mistake and they learned to associate the, the pattern and shape of that caterpillar with an, an, an unpleasant feeling uh, or an unpleasant taste. And so they learned to leave them alone. Rats associate spatial cues with a certain reward, um, but they get there through trial and error. And then of course there's cognition and problem solving, right? Cognition, this takes this a little bit further. This is the ability of an animal's nervous system to not only perceive, but store, process, and use gathered information, okay? So for example, um, this is more like problem solving intelligence, the ability to look at a situation, size it up, use your background knowledge that's stored in your brain to figure out the situation. So if you hung monkey, uh, if you hung bananas on a string from a tree and then set a monkey loose to go get the bananas, they may try to, to reach up or grab the, the string. Um, but after a while, they have to be able to size up that they have to pull the banana up from the string. They have to pull the banana away from the string to be able to get to and eat the banana. Um, so that's looking at a multi-step problem and being able to solve a multi-step problem. Um, it's having the, the insight to be able to visualize next steps and think about and, and 
kind of mentally solve the problem before you physically solve the problem. Um, learning also leads to other things. Um, it leads to the evolution of warning coloration, right? Remember the, the doggies with the small stripy stingy things, right? That's warning coloration. Um, and a doggy just has to bite one small stripy stingy thing to learn to avoid anything that is small and stripy like that. Um, and what you get also is mimicry as a result of this, right? Where um, there are a lot of small stripy things that have stingers as well, and they all look the same because then a predator doesn't have to sample every single one of those to figure out that they're all pretty bad and they should leave them alone, right? Um, but sometimes also some other things that maybe don't have a stinger look stripy and stingy, even though they're not stingy. Um, so sometimes the mimicry is, is um, it's a lie. Um, you also have practice play. This is practice aggression and social behavior. And then again, cognition, the extent to which animals have cognition is really up for debate right now. We definitely know that, that there are certain animals that are better at problem solving than others, but that's about where we are right now with the research on that. And then of course you have social behaviors as well that come up, right? Um, territoriality, um, that's a social behavior um, in that you're maintaining a territory in order to attract a mate. Mate selection is social. Um, social behaviors lead to communication because that's what maintains the social behavior. Sometimes you can even have hierarchies occurring where, um, you know, like wolf packs where, uh, Animals are more successful if they hunt and stay together than they are on their own. And so they will arrange themselves in a hierarchy um, because even the lowest wolf on the hierarchy is, is more successful with the pack than it is if it tries to strike out on its own. Um, you also have altruism, which is up for debate how altruistic altruism is, but the idea of doing a selfless act, right? Usually when you have altruistic acts in nature, um, you have organisms that are related to one another. So there's actually a benefit to the organism because you're benefiting the organism's genome. In fact, let's look at that here. Um, when an animal behaves in a way that it reduces its own individual fitness, but increases the, other fit, the fitness of the other individuals in the population, that's altruism. So you might have worker bees that, that sacrifice the ability to reproduce to serve the colony, right? Um, you may have um, squirrels making alarm calls to one another, right? When you make the alarm call though, that warns the other squirrels in the area to get out of dodge, but then you call the predator's attention onto yourself. Um, typically, like I said, in nature, you see those kinds of behaviors happening when you have close relatives living together, right? Because this, this introduces the concept of inclusive fitness. Um, and I don't know if it was actually said, and I don't know who it's actually credited to. I think I read an article that this was miscredited, but at one point someone was asked, um, a scientist was asked to explain this, this idea of inclusive fitness. And he said, I'd gladly lay down my, my life for five brothers or nine cousins right? Um, and inclusive fitness is recognizing that your genome, to allow your genome to survive, happens when either you reproduce, right? Or when somebody else who shares a portion of your genome reproduces, right? So as yucky as you think your brother or sister is, as disgusting, and you can't imagine anyone liking them, right? If they do reproduce, you share some of your genes with your brother or sister, right? which means if they reproduce, your genes are being passed on to the next generation indirectly. You're not doing it yourself, but you're letting somebody else do that for you. So since you have half of your genome in, in common with a sibling, right, in five brothers, your genome is represented two and a half times, right? In nine cousins, your genome is represented um, two and a quarter times, I believe, if I'm calculating that right. You have about a quarter in common with a first cousin. Okay, and that's the idea there. So this is what we call kin selection, which you see right there. And um, kin selection can be explained using Hamilton's rule. This is not a, um, a math concept that's gonna be on the uh, AP exam. But the idea here is um, 
in order for altruism to happen, this coefficient of relatedness times the benefit has to be greater than the cost. Okay, um, so that's Hamilton's rule. Um, and that leads to social structures as well. So eusociality um, arises when you have this inclusive fitness. Termites, ants, bees are what we call haplodiploid. So females are arise from fertilized eggs. So usually there's a queen, she mates to produce fertilized eggs. Those become females in a colony. Males arise from unfertilized eggs. So males are haploid, which means if you have one king and one queen in a colony and they're mating, all the females, right, share half of their genome with every brother but they share the same half of their genome from their father and then a quarter of their genome from their mother with one another, which means they're 75% in common genetically. Um, and that's why, you know, that's, that's like inclusive fitness on steroids. So that's why females are willing to stay and work for a colony without reproducing themselves and just let the queen continue to reproduce. Um, hierarchies are based on dominance, right? Territorial behavior, behaviors are reinforced by agonistic or aggressive behaviors. And then you also have this concept of reciprocal altruism. That's the you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Um, so I will sacrifice for you this time, but I'm going to expect you to sacrifice for me. And again, to have reciprocal altruism, there has to be a certain amount of cognition there. You have to remember who you sacrificed for and who to go back and get the favor from. Um, and there are some instances of that happening in nature as well.